Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to worship at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. We are in the midst of the Advent season, the season that we set aside to prepare for the coming Christmas celebration. Please be aware as we point ourselves towards Christmas, please be aware of our Christmas Eve worship schedule here at Good Shepherd. We worship on Tuesday. December 24th with two candlelight worship services, two opportunities for worship at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. Next Sunday is the annual choir cantata, a wonderful way to uh, put your heart in the Christmas season. Um, so it's next Sunday during worship is the choir cantata. And then on Wednesday, December 18th at 6.15, the children of the congregation are presenting their Christmas program, so it's a week and a half away. It's entitled The Colors of Christmas, and there's a great group of grandmas who are helping the kids tell the Christmas story this year, so that is a week and a half away. Today after worship, uh, Coffee Fellowship is being served in the basement. It's directly beneath us here at the sanctuary. And today it's being served by high school senior Angel Schroeder. Angel is one of the Good Shepherd youth who are going to South Dakota for a mission trip this summer. And so any funds that you donate during Coffee Fellowship will go directly toward her trip. And thank you for your continued generosity of our uh, youth program here at the church. Today at 10.30 a.m., I'm leading a faith lab class for kindergartners and their parents on the Christmas story, and that will be in the old nursery. And our prayers are with the family and the friends of Donna Mershon. Donna died on Wednesday morning. Her funeral will be here at Good Shepherd on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, please visit the Bruss Heitner website for any more details about that. And as I said, the prayers of the congregation are with uh, Donna's family and friends. I'm going to call Skylar Niebuhr forward. This is very impromptu. She was here a few weeks ago and told about the STAR project for FCCLA at the school that she's working on. And so I asked her to come back. Uh, since she was here at worship, I said, hey, will you give us an update? And she does have an update about the project she's working on. Yeah, I'll just bend it right up there. Um, so, so far, I've got 95 coats. Uh, I'm going to see if it's on. There it is. Okay. So I've got 95 coats so far, four scarves, two hats, 23 pairs of gloves, four of those thick headbands, and 16 pairs of knitted gloves. And I also grabbed some more this morning, and I've been told that it was full again. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's all sitting in my room. Excellent. Thank you for supporting Skylar's project. <laughs> the stuff she's collecting, they'll be delivering it up to Caring and Sharing Hands in Minneapolis to then be passed on to people in need of warm winter coats. Those are all the announcements that I have. We continue with our um, Advent tradition then with the lighting of the Advent wreath, the Erickson family. We're gonna sing, I'm gonna switch this up, Jean. We're gonna sing two verses of hymn 240, verse one and two of 240.
This week we light two candles on the Advent wreath. We light once again the candle of hope and then add to it the second candle which is often called the candle of peace. This candle of peace will shine bright with God's plan that the wolf will lie down with the lamb, that hatred and war will cease and give way to healing and peace. God speaks with a still, small voice that calms the chaos and fears and anger of our world. As we light this second Advent candle, our continued prayer is that we will know peace on earth as promised by the Christmas angels. Thank you, Erickson family. And then we continue by singing um, the song that's uh, in a box on page three in your bulletin, The Whole World is Waiting for Peace. we continue with our confession and forgiveness as printed on the front of your worship bulletin and we gather for worship this morning in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen confident in God's love and mercy let us confess our sins before God and one another God of promise and hope so often we fall short failing to be all that you created us to be. We pester you with questions. Why, God? Where are you, God? We lack faith in your promise of deliverance and hope. Forgive us for all that we have done to harm you, others, and ourselves. Walk with us and make us whole. Our Holy Lord God knows we are weak and frail, yet God loves us and refuses to give up on us. Because of God's persistence, we are made new again and again. Receive today the entire forgiveness of all your sins. Walk with God on your human journey for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Then please join me as we pray together the prayer of the day. God, we are sometimes impatient for you to act according to your vision for the earth. Give us wisdom to see your will unfolding and boldness to be a part of your solution. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And at this time, I don't know if we have any kids except for Evelyn, who probably would have trouble understanding what I'm, what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about it anyway. I know Pastor Meg did this last week. Um, I'm going to start by asking you how many people like waiting? <laughs> Do you like waiting? <laughs> waiting. Do you like to wait? Do you like to wait for things? <laughs> depends on what it is, right? Sometimes it depends on what it is. Do you know that they, a study has said that the average 70-year-old person, so who's brave enough to admit that they're around 70? Anybody? Okay. Do you know that the average 70-year-old person has spent three years of their life waiting? <laughs> waiting for phone calls, waiting in line, waiting for something that you're looking forward to? Dr. Seuss talked about waiting. Dr. Seuss included this poem in one of his more popular books for graduation time, All the Places You'll Go, he talked about waiting. He said, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, waiting around for a yes or a no, 
or waiting for your hair to grow. Everyone is waiting, he said. And he talked about it as a place of frustration. So depending on what we're waiting for, oftentimes the waiting can be frustrating. On Wednesday when I did this children's sermon with the kids, I said, okay, guys, we're waiting now for something to come. And they knew immediately what I was talking about, waiting for Christmas, they said. And I said, when would you like Christmas to be here? And they all said right away, today or tomorrow, some of them said. Excited for it to be here now. It's hard to wait for something you're eager for and want to be here right now. In wisdom, church leaders plan the church calendar this way and have us waiting. It's a waiting time. We're waiting, but not idle waiting. The word prepare is woven into Advent just as much as waiting. That song we just sang, The Whole World is Waiting, talked about waiting for peace this week, last week. When you let it, it said waiting for hope. And then we'll talk about waiting for joy and waiting for love. The key to it is, as people of God, not only are we waiting for those things during Advent season and all the time, the key to it is we are the ones who are called to help bring those things to this earth. So not only are we waiting for peace and waiting for hope, for love and waiting for joy, we're called to bring them here to our earth and prepare them here for the earth. So during the waiting time, sometimes you can do things as idly as twiddling your thumbs, but as people of God, we're called to be doing work during this waiting time, and so we prepare. I know a lot of us are doing things like this in our homes, decorating and doing the preparations, and we're to prepare as well for these things we keep praying for. We pray for peace. We're waiting for peace. We're called to bring it to our corner of the world, to our homes, to our families, to our places where we work, where we bump into people in the grocery store. We're called to bring peace and joy and love and not just wait idly for these things, but to do our work to bring them. And then I shared this poem with the kids on Wednesday night. As we prepare, as we wait, it said, four, three, two, one, count the weeks till Jesus comes. Each week we add another light. We hope for Jesus burning bright. We pray, we share, we do our part to welcome Jesus to our heart. So use these weeks of waiting to welcome Jesus to your heart, to your homes, and to our corner of the world. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this Advent waiting. Thank you for this Advent waiting. Help us prepare. Help us prepare to bring Jesus into our heart, to bring Jesus into our heart, and to bring Jesus to our community, and to bring Jesus to our community. Amen. Come on. Pastor Meg would not be happy with you. Well, how do we do it? Amen. Amen.
the psalm this morning, and we will read it responsibly, is Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to the life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you faiths, faithful ones. Give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, O Lord, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried. To the Lord, I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will I tell of your faithfulness? Hear me, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Here ends the scripture reading. The scripture is printed in your bulletin, but I had Andy put it on the back of the bulletin. The reason is somebody on Wednesday night asked me if I could include a section where you might take notes and follow along with my sermon. And so it's there on the back, and I had Andy put the scripture passages there. So um, if you wish, you can grab a pencil or a pen out of your purse and follow along with my sermon and make notes. It was a request someone had, and they said, um, I want to follow along deeper into your sermon. So I prepared this this morning. Two scripture passages today as we focus in the midst of Advent on joy, finding Christmas joy. The first passage, both are from prophets, Old Testament prophets who pointed the people toward the coming Jesus. First, Jeremiah 31. God spoke through Jeremiah saying, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a, shep and as a shepherd of flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden. They shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice and dance. The young men and the old be merry. I will turn their mourning, their grieving into dancing or into joy. I will comfort them. I will give them gladness to replace the sorrow. And then Habakkuk, lesser known prophet, talks about still that anticipation. Habakkuk said, though the fig tree does not blossom, no fruit is on the vine. Though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, still, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. This is a psalm to the leader with stringed instruments. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, from our Lord and our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Kent has the Christmas decorations here done here at Good Shepherd. <coughs> We're always so grateful for that. 
So what have you done to prepare for Christmas in your families, in your lives? Do you have your Christmas decorations up? How many people have the tree up? Oh, goodness. I can't put my hand up yet. I don't have my tree up. Okay, I have done, I have done almost nothing to prepare for Christmas except my kids have said I've done the one important thing. And that is I have the left some aid. <laughs> so they said Christmas can continue even if the other things aren't done. Okay? I hope to put the tree up soon and get started with the other stuff. But I'll be honest with you, the real preparation for Christmas happens right here. Right here in worship during this season of Advent. And that's why you're here, I hope, at least partly, and that's what this whole season is about, as we prepare to celebrate the gift that God gives to us that you can't buy on Amazon and you can't buy in the malls, a gift that you will never outgrow. The gift, of course, the baby born in the stable, the Christ child given to us by God. This is a gift that I hope you experience this Christmas season the Savior who came to walk among us, to bring us peace and hope and love and joy. This season, I'm hoping that we focus mainly on joy. So every week, the sermon is focusing on joy, partly because I have really felt like that has been lacking for us in our lives lately. And partly as well, I'm having us focus on joy because this season is the 500th birthday of our wonderful, beloved, for many of us, favorite Christmas carol, Joy to the World. Turns 500 years this Advent season. And so to help celebrate and to help us hopefully bring some Christmas joy into our lives, we're focusing on joy. There are seasons in our lives, though, where it is hard to find the joy, hard to feel the joy. Seasons when we don't feel like singing joy to the world, and it's hard to find the joy in our hearts. So today I want us to think about how we might find joy at Christmas time. Now, when I talk about seeking joy in our lives, I'm not talking about how to combat depression. Okay, I want to get that straight before I go any further. Depression is a medical condition, and it's real, and I'm not suggesting that I can stand up here and talk away depression. Instead, I want us to focus on the theology of joy. I want us to open the Bibles up and think about what the Bible says about joy and how it's possible to experience joy even in the midst of darkness in our lives. Before I open the Bible, though, I want to open the dictionary. The dictionary definition of joy is the feeling of great pleasure or happiness. That's what Webster says. Feeling of great pleasure or happiness. So if you want to look at your insert or the back of your bulletin, I start with a question. And I want you to think about it, okay? Think about that question, what is the one thing in your life that gives you great joy or happiness or pleasure? Now, I'm, I'm kind of introverted, so it cr makes me cringe, but if you really want to, you can even turn to the person next to you and tell them what that is. What's the one thing that brings you joy or happiness? Now what's interesting is I watched you think about it or turn to the person next to you and smile at each other. Because I know what you were thinking, Jeanette, when you looked at Roger, okay? <laughs> I hope you were looking at him and saying, it's you, honey. <laughs> I was trying to read your mind. Is that what you were thinking? Okay, she says, sure. Sure, that's it. Okay. What's neat is as I asked you that question, even as you just thought about it or as you turned to somebody 
and answered the question, many of you smiled, which is great. Now, the things that bring me joy in my lives are things like my kids, okay, who don't live at home anymore, and I uh, love to be around them, even though it's hard to become a parent to adult children. I'm struggling with that a little bit, but they bring me lots of joy and lots of happiness. Spending time with friends, I like to go to concerts and movies and plays with friends, and then my parents. I still have my parents in my life, and I'm especially close with my mom, and I love to be in Austin and spend time with them. And what I realized is I thought about what brings me joy. It's not things, right? It's often the people, the relationships that we have, not the stuff. And it's good to remember that as you do your Christmas shopping, maybe it's more just like the Grinch realized. Maybe it's more about the relationships relationships and the experiences rather than the stuff of the Christmas season. If joy is only defined by things that bring us happiness and pleasure in the moment, I'm in trouble. Why? Because I only see my kids a few times a month if I'm lucky, and I only see my folks once a month. So then it's good to ask, then where do I find joy in between? those times and I want to suggest that the Bible offers different definitions of joy and most of the time joy is the disposition or the nature of the heart the shape of our heart it's the way of life that's a lot like gratitude in the Bible joy isn't just by happiness in the moment but it's the way that you have your heart shaped and the way you look at life. And the Bible says when it's shaped like gratitude, it's a joy that you can have, not just in the moment, like when I'm with my kids, but I can have it all the time. And you can even have it in the midst of darkness in your lives. Let me explain what I mean. Hebrews 12 is one of the passages that talks about joy. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who for joy faced the cross. Now, Jesus was not happy at that moment when he died on the cross. We can all agree on that. It hurt, okay? But he knew that it would change the world, and for that reason, it brought Jesus joy. Another example is Paul and Silas. In the book of Acts, they tell a story about Paul and Silas who were beaten to the point of almost being dead. And then they were thrown in prison. And the story that says that when they were thrown in prison in the middle of the night, they sang songs of joy. They weren't happy about what they went and experienced, but they found a joyful nature in their hearts. Their hearts were molded to gratitude because they knew God was with them, even in that time of pain. One theologian, his name is Miroslav Wolf, wrote about joy and adversity in our lives, and he said, we can have something like joy even when things are difficult. What's the source of our joy, he asked? Obviously, some experiences will bring us pain, but we can also find joy. He said it's the same way that Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always even when we're hurting we can rejoice that god is good despite the bad things despite the suffering what we go through in this life can be tough but we can still feel joy because god sticks with us through it all there are 400 verses in the bible that talk about joy and from those 400, there are three different kind of joys that are in the Bible. And I've outlined them there in your bulletin. The first kind, the first kind of joy that's in the Bible is euphoria. Okay? The kind of joy we experience when something happy happens. When babies are born in the Bible, the word joy is mentioned, and it's this kind of joy, euphoria. Or after a good harvest, or freedom from slavery. In the moment, they experience joy, and we love that. 
the kind of joy I feel when I'm with my kids, okay? So we know that kind of joy often. The second kind of joy that's defined in the Bible is about a future thing, something that will happen in the future. When the prophets talked about you will have joy when you are delivered from slavery, that kind of joy is a different word than, than that first one, something that God is going to do, anticipating a good thing that God is going to bring about in your life. And the important thing about this kind of joy is that it involves faith on our part. Trusting that no matter what happens, God is good, and God will deliver us. It's talked about this kind of joy is used in Psalm 30, when, Connie led it today, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. God is good. God will bring us, even when we're weeping, God will bring us joy in the morning. So as people of faith, we can trust, and it's about molding our hearts that way with gratitude, we can trust that the worst thing that happens in our lives is never the last thing. It's never the end of the story. In the middle of darkness, light will come. It might be tomorrow, it might be next month, it might be in five years. The psalmist gives thanks to God. You've changed my grief into dancing. Connie read that for us today, too. You dressed me up in joy, and I will give thanks to you with joy forever. It's about trusting that in the middle of darkness, God is with us. And I like that phrase, the worst thing is never the last thing. One of the Bible stories that I had us read was from Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah was trying to help the people of God trust that joy would come because they were in a tough situation. The Babylonians had come and conquered the land. Then not only that, not only did they get invaded, but then the people of God were marched off back to Babylon, the conquerors, took them to Babylon, and it's a period of time we call the Babylonian captivity they were marched back to Gap Babylon and made to be slaves there. And it was a terrible time. And Jeremiah was the prophet that was sent to give them hope in the midst of that time. God came and said, this is not the last thing that will happen to you. It feels like the worst thing, but it's not the last thing that God will deliver you. And so Jeremiah preached about joy and it wasn't joy in that moment, but it was joy anticipating that God would deliver them. I know the plans I have for you, said Jeremiah. Plans to prosper and plans to have hope. And he reminded them, there is time to prosper and there is time to hope and it will come in the future. Nothing but God will have the final word while you suffer. God says the same to you and I. I have plans for you. Plans to give you a future, plans for you to have hope in your life. Walk into the future with hope and have joy. So this biblical joy, this second kind of joy talked about in the Bible is a joy anticipating that God will be faithful to you and bring you light in the darkness. The third kind of joy that's talked about in the Bible describes a joy that comes in believing that whatever hardship you're walking through, somehow God will cause good to come from it. Paul said it, talked about it in Romans 8, my favorite verse, in all things God works together for good for those who love and serve the Lord. We will have joy even when bad things happen. God does not cause the bad things to happen, but God forces good to come from them. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about this, quoted this verse from Paul, and he said it this way, God wrings good from evil, God bends it and forces good to come right there in the midst of bad things. As we're walking through terrible times, 
hard times, stressful times, we might ask, I wonder what God can do with this dark situation. It's the kind of question you should ask as people of faith. What good can come from this dark situation? That's why Jesus faced the cross with joy because he knew that God would try to bring good from it. God would use the cross to bring eternal life to the world. This week I sat with the Mershon family as Donna was passing. And she said at the end, her last words were, I have to go. She reached up to the ceiling. Okay? Hard? Yes. They were saying their goodbyes to her and they knew her moments on earth we're almost done. But yet they said, one of the cousin, one of the nieces said, um, I think she phrased it this way, it was one of the holiest moments and I felt that thin veil, she said, because I stood there on the edge of heaven, she said, watching my aunt reach out her hands and say, I have to go. God brings good even out of the saddest moments. God doesn't waste suffering. God doesn't cause suffering. But God uses it and brings good from it. Paul said, the joy of the Lord is your strength in those hard times. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And he said later, give thanks and have joy in all situations. Joy that there are gifts and beauty. There was beauty at that time, even though it was the saddest moment. As her family stood by and said their goodbyes and they had pain, there was joy. Because they watched as Donna literally then went to heaven. I've told you before that my daughter Rachel was really sick. During junior and senior high, she was so sick that she couldn't even walk anymore. If she stood up, her blood pressure plummeted and she would pass out. So finally the doctor said you need to use a wheelchair and you need to try to stop standing up. And it was hard because she couldn't be in school. And she was living a very isolated life. It was dark time for our family. One day in the midst of that darkness, Sam had a friend over and they were down in the basement playing video games. And all of a sudden I saw this 17 year old kid come up from the basement and walk down the hall and he realized maybe his sister would like to come and hang out with him and his buddy Bob and then I watched as this big 17 year old kid pick up his sister in his arms and carry her down the stairs so they could have some fun together and my heart melted and I will forever have that image in my head and in my heart and I found joy that day, not joy because Rachel was sick, but joy that my son was being developed and molded into having a good and loving heart that was a direct result of his sister being so very sick. The big promise from God is that God brings good out of bad situations, even life out of death. So those are the three kinds of joy that are talked about in the Bible. And I want to add that joy doesn't simply happen to us. It's about us choosing joy every single day. That's what I want to invite you to do during this Advent season. Choose joy. To trust in God that in the end, all will be well. The Bible is a story of people who are walking. Walking in dark places. It's a story of how God walks beside them through those dark places. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, God walked with those people. And then finally, as we turn into the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God put skin on and was born as the baby Jesus so that God would know what our troubles feel like 
and bring us light in the times of darkness, hope and joy in times of struggle. So maybe this season you need joy in your life, and I hope that you can choose joy. Or perhaps you're in a position to bring joy into someone else's life. Because there are people around you, maybe they're sitting near you in church today, maybe they work with you, maybe they're people you're going to bump into this week who are struggling to feel merry and bright during this Christmas season. They may be struggling to just hold it all together right now. And then maybe your call is to reach out to others to help them have joy this Christmas. So you can be God with skin on and bring strength and remind them that they're not alone. For people of faith, we can have joy because Jesus was born for us, bringing light and life and joy. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, when we are facing dark times, help us to remember that the worst thing is never the last thing. There is always hope. Help us to choose joy. Help us to bring joy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together out of our red hymnal, an Advent hymn, 242. I invite you to rise as we use the Apostles' Creed to confess our common faith and our common belief. It's printed on page 105 at the front part of your red hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment to greet those around you with this peace which comes from God. This time the ushers will receive your offering. I invite you to rise and we sing verses 1 and 2 of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel 257.
gratitude for God's mercy and justice, we pray for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. Gracious and holy Lord God, we give you thanks that because of you, we can have joy this Christmas season. Our joy is not dependent on what is going on in our lives or in the world. Our joy doesn't depend on gifts we give or receive. Our joy comes from you, God. As we prepare for the coming Christmas celebration, we ask you, God, to fill our hearts with gratitude. Let joy be a part of our Christmas preparations and use us to bring joy into the hearts of others as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prince of Peace, with your mighty hand, bring peace to our world. Bring peace where there is war. Bring light where there is darkness. Bring life where there is death. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, we pray that you will help us prepare for the coming Christmas celebration. Help us slow down. Help us sip life rather than gulp it. Help us prepare to welcome the Christ child into our hearts and homes again this Christmas season. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of Lords, grant wholeness and comfort to all who are in need of your soothing touch, of your healing touch. Today we pray for families who are grieving we lift up in prayer the Donna Mershon family and all others who are grieving. May they know the promise of the resurrection, which brings hope to those who grieve. We pray for those in need of your healing touch. We lift up in prayer those who are preparing for surgery. We pray for Gary Kaufman as he prepares for shoulder surgery this week. We pray for Edie Zabel. We pray for Bebo Getchell. We pray for all others whom we name now silently within our hearts. We pray as well for our loved ones who are serving in the military, praying, God, keep them safe in your care. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting that the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations, we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending song is also printed in your bulletin. It's on page three there, and it's entitled Choose to Hope. Remember that Coffee Fellowship is being served downstairs on Jell Schroeder is serving it today. And then uh, please find joy in your life this week ahead. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.